Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the College of Fellows event um, this evening. The first time an online event, um, so a, a, a great new thing for us to, to try. I um, So I'd just like to introduce, well, firstly to acknowledge that um, the, the College of Fellows event is really a pinnacle in the in UCT's um, calendar, time when we honour um, those who have great research accolades, both as established researchers becoming um, fellows, but also our young research awards um, this evening. So I'd like to quickly take you through the um, through the events for this evening. Um, following my short introduction, I will have an address from our Vice Chancellor, Professor Mamaketi Pakeng. And then we'll move into our Young Research Awardees, um, and go through their citations, and from there we'll introduce our new fellows, um, which um, um, Prof. Pakeng will do. And uh, after that, we've got an informal piece uh, where some of our um, current fellows and uh, new fellows will uh, introduce us to some light moments. I'm sure that this will be um, very entertaining and I look forward to it, but I'm going to move straight on and uh, hand you over to our Vice-Chancellor, Professor Mamacheti Pakeng, to, in, to give her address. Thank you very much, Sue. Good evening, colleagues. Sanwanani Dumelang, hello. Um, this has been a rough year, and, but believe it or not, we have many things to be thankful for. To begin with, here we all are, alive and somewhat well. We are not gathered in the same physical space, but we are together. I enjoy being with you, even if it's virtually. Many of us have learned more this year about digital technology than we ever knew before. We've had to change how we teach, how we interact with students and colleagues, and how we work as researchers and authors and analysts and teachers. I would guess that you have been so busy this year, just keeping up with all these necessary changes that you may not have had much time to consider how you may have changed or how you may still be changing. Not just as an academic, as a fellow of the University of Cape Town, but also as a life partner, a parent, as a member of your extended family, as a UCT colleague, a friend, and as a thinking and feeling human being. The executive is aware of the number of staff members, including academics who have approached UCT counseling services for help in dealing with the stresses of this year. You all have many responsibilities outside of the academic sphere, relationships that are affected during this time. We are all feeling stretched. The natural human response to the year we are having is to think, I cannot wait for things to get back to normal. Well, this is the kind of response many people would expect from the College of Fellows because you are the, you are the elders of the University of Cape Town and elders are often considered the keepers of tradition, the ones who remind the community of the way we have always done things. But I think of elders in a different way. You are the people with experience and the wisdom to navigate and negotiate and lead change. You have skills, not just in weathering, weathering change, but in using change to your advantage, especially in the field of your study. Every one of us, has experienced failures and disappointments, and we have grown through them. In fact, we may even see how our successes were made possible because of our failures. We are here today in the College of Fellows because we followed a road that led us through disappointments, disillusionment, wrong turnings and mistakes, as well as achievements, flashes of insights, opportunities and rewards. So we now have this special privilege of helping our students and colleagues to, to negotiate the path that has been laid before us by the pandemic and its consequences in our lives. Colleagues in the leadership of the university will know how much I've been talking about Nicholas, Nassim Nicholas Taleb. And he talks about this privilege in his book, Antifragile, Things That Gain From Disorder. While resilience is the ability to resist shocks and remain the same. Antifragility is the ability to grow stronger and even thrive as a result of shock, stress, and disorder. And I've been learning a lot more about this concept of antifragility. Antifragility teaches us to value and use friction that comes with a crisis or challenge for growth. 
it is like that old adage what doesn't destroy you making strong make you makes you stronger but anti-fragility is not a passive response to shock it is an active choice that we make to use the chaos that has come upon us to make positive changes to reconsider the assumptions we work and live by and to grow this also applies to how we learn Taleb says, and I quote, the process of discovery or innovation or technological pro progress itself depends on anti-fragile tinkering, aggressive risk bearing rather than formal education, close quote. He refers to exploiting errors to make lemonade out of lemons. Our work as researchers and educators is to share three kinds of powers. Students come to us with the expectation that we will share the power of knowing and that this will translate to the power of doing. We see these powers in our lectures, the result of examinations, the discussions we have with our students and colleagues, the papers we write, the questions they ask, the experiments they conduct, the new patents they may apply for. These powers often receive rewards in the form of academic distinction, awards, fellowships and other honors. But there is a third power that we share, often without being aware of it, and that's the power of being. This may not be demonstrated in academic terms, but it is the force that is at work in our daily lives. It is in our decisions and it is in our relationships. The power of being is the moral foundation we stand upon as we confront challenges and lead others. Often, what people respond to is not just what we know, or what we have done, but the kind of person they recognize in us. It can be hard for students to see us as people, as fellow students of life. They call us professor, but they may be distracted by our age, by their perceptions of us based on superficial factors like our gender, our accent, the color of our skin. They feel the pressure to prove themselves to us on an academic level, but we can also teach them on a deeper level. This week, a student sent a tweet. In fact, he's a student who's also in the music industry, but he sent a tweet that demonstrates that kind of deeper knowing that we can pass on. He's studying uh, through Get Smarter and it's Proverb, um, those who know Proverb. And, and he said, as I get into module six of my Get Smarter UCT investment management course, I realized that perhaps in school, I struggled because I was learning to pass and finish. Whereas now I'm learning to empower myself, understand and apply and therefore enjoying it. Uh, students are eager to know and to do. We need to encourage, we need to encourage them to also develop their life skills to be people of courage who can grow through change. And the best way to teach the power of being is to share with others the hard lessons we have learned and are still learning about change. This doesn't mean we cannot exercise the power of knowing and doing. Those are important aspects of academic life, but the power of being is also something that we are teaching, even if we are not aware of it. And the power of being, I believe, is what will empower our students to lead others in the kinds of changes we are going to continue to see around the world, even long after COVID-19 has been solved. I'm thankful today, not only for the lessons that you teach us at UCT, the research you conduct, the papers you publish, but also for the lesson you and I are still learning and can pass on as lifelong students, as fellows in academia, and as elders in life. So welcome, and I look forward to a, an evening full of lessons and laughter and engagement. Thanks very much to you. Thank you, Katie. Thanks for that um, inspiring set of words and getting us on our way and also to remember the, the role of us as fellows within um, UCT. It's my privilege now to go on and introduce to you the Young Fellow Awardees. Um, so we have seven this year and I'm going to read a short citation on each of, of the fellows. Um, there is a, a, a two minutes um, recording of, their, of, their, of them presenting their work. Which is going to be on, which is on the website, and the um, link to the website will be posted into the chat, so that we can all go and look at them so talking about their work later on. But let me first introduce them to you. 
So I'm going to start with Associate Professor Nico Fisher, um, who is a researcher in the Catalysis Institute in the Department of Chemical Engineering, and more, specific, more specifically in the um, DSI NRF Center of Excellence in Catalysis, or, or sea change. His research focuses on the development of novel materials for heterogeneously catalyzed synthesis gas conversions and carbon dioxide activation processes. A specific focus of the study is on active materials under relevant reaction conditions, monitoring phase and structural changes in real time. After completing his undergraduate degree at Karlsruhe Institute of Technology in Germany, Nico joined UCT as a PhD student in, 20, in 2007, working on a model ca catalyst system for the fischer tropsch syn synthesis. This is the industrial process which converts syngas into liquid fuels. In 2011, he returned to Germany as the research team leader for heterogeneous cat catalysis at BASF, one of the big chemical companies. But he returned to UCT in tw 2014 as a senior research officer and was promoted to associate professor in 2018. He's very active in uh, postgraduate supervision and convenes the master's coursework in catalysis. So in addition to his um, um, many uh, impactful journal papers and presentations at conferences, he is a co-inventor in seven patent fa um, families, which has resulted in 15 patents um, granted in various um, countries. Um, and amongst his inventions, there is a sample a presentation device to study materials under realistic at, um, atmospheres with X-ray diffractometry. And this is currently being produced under license by a UCT spin-off company. Um, Nico has many awards to his name, and I'm going to skip over them. He holds a Y1 NRF rating, and he plays a very large role in the catalysis research community in South Africa as part of the uh, Committee of the Catalysis Society, representing the South African Catalysis Society on the International Catalysis Societies and the European Federation of Catalysis Societies and um, being on organizing committees of um, international conferences. He also plays a big role in the um, Center of Excellence and um, I'm particularly there want to uh, mention work that he has done in uh, spearheading the development of physical sciences teaching materials for high school learners through the Chem Roots project. These materials were distributed to over 120 high school teachers in the Western Cape as a large scale training e event and they used at the Cape Town Science Centre. Nico, well done and we welcome you as a young research um, awardee. Our second uh, uh, YRAC awardee is Christopher Tresos, who is um, a senior researcher and director of the Climate Risk Lab in the African Climate and Development Initiative. The lab integrates data and methods for environmental and social sciences to help inform rapid, just and equitable responses to, clim to the climate crisis. The current research questions include whether ecological disruption from climate change will be gradual or abrupt, and how climate change impacts prevalence of um, infectious disease, whether solar geoengineering increases climate change risks, and how to manage risks across interconnected social and environmental systems. Dr. Tresis is the coordinating lead author on the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change Sixth Assessment Report. He's responsible for Chapter 9, which is the Working Group of Working Group 2, African Climate Change Impacts, Adaptation and Vulnerability. He's also consulted on climate change adaptation for the World Bank. Dr. Trisos spent three years as a postdoctoral fellow at the National Social Environmental Synthesis Center at the University of Maryland, um, where his research focused on biodiversity and climate change. He earned a doctorate in zoology at Oxford University, where he was a Rhodes Scholar, and his, his research is currently funded by the Future Leader African Independent Researcher, or FLAIR Program Fellowship of the Royal Society and African Academies, Academy of Sciences. Congratulations, Christopher. Our third uh, young researcher awardee is Dr. Itmoleng uh, Monageng. Um, he is a stellar astrophysicist, currently holding a joint lectureship position between the University of Cape Town and the South African Astronomical Observatory. His research focuses on the studies of X-ray binary stars, where he uses um, data, data from telescopes operating at different wavelengths including the South African Large Telescope and Meerkat, 
to understand physical processes taking place in these, um, in these systems. Dr. Monageng completed his PhD in 2018, after which he briefly joined the South African Large um, Telescope, SALT, um, operations team, where he was involved in the daily running of the telescope and performed service observing for an international research community. He held a postdoctoral position at the South African Astronomy Observatory, where he continued his research on interacting um, stellar systems. He has authored um, 17 publications and is currently supervising students at various levels from undergrad to PhD. He's been awarded a whole range of pri prizes from his days as, uh, as a postgrad student um, to being selected as one of the top 20 scientists for the prestigious 69th um, Lindo Nobel uh, Laureate meeting in 2019. Dr. Monageng gives public talks and written media articles about his research in various platforms. He's done several radio and TV interviews covering wide topic, a range of topics on astronomy. He appeared as a regular guest in the SABC education um, science programs and community radio stations and uh, is very focused on making science accessible to Setsuana speaking people. Congratulations, Dr. Monageng. Our fourth um, young researcher awardee is Dr. Ryan Neft. Dr. Neft is a senior lecturer um, in the Department of Philosophy. He's under, he completed his undergraduate honours and masters at UCT before becoming the second South African um, at the time to graduate with a Master of Logic from the well-renowned Institute of Logic, Language and Computation at the University of Amsterdam. After his master's, he pursued a PhD in philosophy at the University of St Andrews in Scotland. He completed his PhD dissertation in record time of two years with no corrections. Um, during uh, these studies spanning 10 years, Dr Neft received research fellowships from the Universities of Michigan, Leeds, Texas at Austin, Yale, Edinburgh and Minnesota. He's received, uh, recently received a prestigious fellowship at the Center for Philosophy of Science at the University of Pittsburgh for 2021. He's been invited to spend um, a year of research at MIT's um, renowned Lin Linguistics and Philosophy Department for 2022. His research is truly interdisciplinary. The primary area is broadly in cognitive science with specializations in theoretical linguistics and the philosophy of language. Um, he's published 11 peer-reviewed articles in some of the highest ranking international linguistics and philosophy journals, um, four invited book chapters, and he has got a forthcoming edited volume with um, Palgrave and Macmillan. Most recently, he's published articles in mathematical linguistics, machine learning, and the philosophy of science, respectively. And since arriving at UCT, some of his highlights have been, in, be, have been to be invited to co-author the Stanford Encyclopedia on Philosophy, subject entry on philosophy of linguistics, receiving the Faculty of Humanities Emerging Researcher Award in 2020, and being confirmed um, and prom um, promoted to senior lecturer within one year of appointment. In the near future, he hopes to expand his research into the philosophy of AI, with specific focus on Africa and the effective implementation of machine learning and big data on the continent. Congratulations, Ryan, quite a, quite a lot of, uh, quite some achievements. So our next um, awardee of the Young Researcher Award is Dr. Elena Tosca, Senior Research Officer at the Center for Social Science Research, where she leads the UCT team on, of the Accelerate Hub, a research fund awarded by the UK um, Global Challenge Research Fund to a joint UCT University of Oxford team and a portfolio of associated studies. Her work has contributed to two interconnected um, yet standalone research studies. The first is adolescent HIV and the second adolescent mothers and their children. Very important and yet understudied, under-researched um, topics with implications for many generations on our society at large. She has, she is a co-PI of two large uh, social science cohorts, um, Mazansi Wako and Hey Baby, and his PI of the Uplift um, study, a collaboration with the um, NICD um, and NHLS, um, and NHLS. She obtained her BA from Princeton University in 2005 
completed her PhD at the University of Oxford in 2017 and was postdoctoral fellow at UCT until mid-2019. Dr. Tosca's research highlights, um, Dr. Tosca's research provides insights into the health of adolescents living with HIV in South Africa and the region, particularly sexual and reproductive health and adolescent motherhood. As a result of her scientific contributions, Dr. Tosca is a member of the Scientific Advisory Board for the Social Impact Bond of Ad Adolescent Girls and Young, young Women, led by um, the MRC, and, and, and an academic representative of the HIV Task Prevention Team of South Africa National AIDS Council. Dr. Tosca, um, and she represents, she adv regularly advises um, to UNICEF, um, the UN Population Fund, World Health Programme, and many others. The next one is uh, Marcus Arnold. He is prize-winning by, he holds a prize-winning binational German-French doctorate in comparative and francophone literatures, where he investigated questions of violence and interculturality on contemporary novel writing in the Ind Indian Ocean Islands. From his early studies in romance and English philolo philology, he ha was attracted to interdisciplinarity within human humanities and arts, as well as complex identities emanating from literary and creative production of post-colonial or global South locations. He has taught in Lyon, France, and at the University of uh, La Réunion, where he worked in a research group dedicated to creolization and vernacular cultures, and at the, the L'Ecole Supérieure d'Art, also in Réunion, engaging with visual art, graphic literature, and contemporary art. He joined UCT School of Languages and Literature as Associate Professor in 2018, Associate Professor of French and Francophone Studies, lecturing on modern and contemporary literature, literary and post-colonial theory, intertextuality, intermediality, and film. He has contributed substantially to the emerging field of Indian Ocean literary studies by investigating um, complex inscriptions of post-coloniality of these so-called peripheral writers. They're complex, they're multiple ways of representing intersectional and diasporic um, processes of belonging. His commitment to interdisciplinary um, research can be seen in recent publications on migration, slavery, and the colonial archive of graphic literature, but also in the circulation of the Global South literature in World Republic Letters. Um, his expertise connecting both Indian Ocean locations and the large intercultural and post-colonial contact zones is substantial. He's recently become editor-in-chief of the DHET um, journal, French Studies in Southern Africa, and he is working on a co-publication of a special issue of African literary and artistic manifestos and crossing of cultural par paradigms. Well done, um, Marcus. And our final, last but not least, um, young researcher awardee is Susan Cunningham. Susie grew up in New Zealand and completed her undergraduate and postgraduate degrees in ecology there. She moved to South Africa in 2010, joining the Fitzpatrick Institute of African Ornithology in the Department of Biological Sciences as a postdoc on the Hot Birds Research um, Project. This is an international collaboration uh, aiming at understanding impacts of climate change on birds and involves the universities of Cape Town, Pretoria, New Mexico and Western Australia, amongst others. The major focus of Susie's research is in understanding the mechanistic links between temperature and fitness and um, in birds under climate change. She is co-PI of the Hot uh, Birds Research Project, and she leads the, the behavioral ecology side of the project, while Andrew um, McKenney at the University of Pretoria focuses on thermal physiology. In recent years, they've increasingly published and supervised students together across these two themes, leading to high uh, publication and high impact cutting edge work, which can be argued to lead the field internationally. Identifying the existence and critical importance of missed opportunities, costs associated with the behavioral thermoregulation is probably Susie's most valuable recent contribution to her research field. She has published the first empirical data on the theme um, for, for birds between 2012 and 2020, building the case of profound impact of behavioral um, costs of thermoregulation across multiple taxa over this time. This work has stimulated global interest um, including new outputs from research teams in the USA and Australia, 
which heavily cites Susie's um, series of papers. She describes herself as one of the lucky ones who knew from a young age that she wanted to be a biologist working with birds and that she had the support and opportunity to do this, to follow the stream. A mentor and PhD super supervisor, Dr. Castro, uh, Dr. Castro of Massey University in New Zealand, supported her ambition to become a field biologist ever since they first met when Susie was 11 years old. She strives to pay her way forward to support um, her students and postdocs and to help them achieve their ambitions. She feels strongly that much of the credit for this work was due to the incredible team of collaborators and students with whom she has had the privilege to work. Congratulations, Susie. So with that, we welcome our seven new young research awardees. And I hand back to uh, Hetty to introduce us to our new fellows. Thanks very much, Sue. Colleagues, I encourage you to visit the UCT website to view the pre-recorded messages from the Young Researcher Award recipients because they are truly, truly inspiring. So don't miss out on this opportunity. It is now my privilege to present to you the new fellows for 2020, and I'll do that in alphabetical order. Their full citations are also loaded onto the website and were circulated to you with your invitations for this evening. I start with Professor Linda Gale Becker. Professor Linda Gale Becker is Deputy Director of the Desmond Tutu HIV Center in the Institute of Infectious Disease and Molecular Medicine and, Depart and Department of Medicine in the Health Sciences Faculty. She has received numerous awards in recognition of her major contributions to the prevention and treatment of HIV and tuberculosis. Linda, congratulations on being admitted into the College of Fellows. We're really delighted to have your caliber in our midst. We'll talk to you again later. Next is Professor Harun Borat. Professor Harun Borat is Director of the Development Policy Research Unit here at UCT, a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institute and a research fellow at ESA, the Institute for the Study of Labor in Bonn, Germany. He serves on the Presidential Economic Advisory Council established by the President, President Ramaphosa, to generate new ideas for economic growth, job creation, and addressing poverty. Harun, congratulations on being admitted to the College of Fellows. We are really delighted to be in your midst, not only tonight, but for the rest of the life of the university. See you later. All right, Professor Jonathan Blackburn. Professor Jonathan Blackburn, the South African Research Chair in Applied Proteo Proteomics and Chemical Biology and Head of the African Network for Drugs and Diagnostics Innovation Center for Excellence in Proteomics and Genomics at UCT. He has developed and commercialized world-leading protein macro microarray technology, a sector that is still largely unique in South Africa today. Jonathan, welcome on your nomination to the College of Fellows. We look forward to engaging with you later and enjoying the, your caliber here at UCT for much longer. Congratulations. Professor Johan Fagan. Professor Johan Fagan has significantly advanced head and neck oncological surgery in developing countries. He established the first head and neck oncological surgery fellowship program at UCT which has so far trained 14 African head and neck surgeons since 2005, reducing patient mobility and mortality across the continent. His online open access atlas of otolaryngology, head and neck operative surgery textbook is used globally. Johan, welcome to the College of Fellows. Really delighted to have your caliber in our midst and looking forward to talking to you later. Oh, to hearing from you. Congratulations. All right, and Professor Mark Fleshman. Professor Mark Fleshman has made significant advances to the national and international theater and performance landscape. He has especially excelled in an area of the discipline known as theater or performance making, which effectively draws on the legacies of oppression and draws imaginatively from a decolonial ethic that places his research at the very cutting edge of contemporary African scholarship. Congratulations, Mark, on your <laughs> acceptance to the College of Fellows. We look forward to hearing from you later. Great. 
And then of course we have Professor London Mayer, who I don't think is present with us tonight, um, uh, but he's also uh, being admitted into the College of Fellows. Professor London Mayer is an epidemiologist in the Faculty of Health Sciences who has made major contributions to each component of the World Health Organization's four pillar strategy for the prevention of mother to health, mother to child transmission of HIV. His specific focus has been on antiretroviral therapy used in pregnant and breastfeeding women living with HIV in Southern Africa. Congratulations to Landon in, her, in, in his absence. I'm sure when you meet him the next time, you will congratulate him on being admitted to the College of Fellows. Congratulations to all of you, and I'm sure we'll hear much from you later. At this point in time, I want to hand over to Professor Sue Harrison. Sue? Thanks, Katie. Thank you for that. And you and I have both got through our very long words out of disciplines that we know nothing about um, to welcome these wonderful people to, to, the, uh, to the College of Fellows. So now it is my um, chance for us to move on to the less formal part of this evening. Uh, we, as you will know, debated hard as to what we should do for a, a College of Fellows dinner when we couldn't have a dinner. Um, and so there was a small team who came up with these, some innovative ideas. And I would like to hand over to Professor Chimsami Turin, who we all know as a paleobiologist from the Department of Biological Sciences, to lead us into our next piece of the evening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sue. It is such a wonderful pleasure to be here this evening to welcome the new fellows and to congratulate all the young researchers. This is such a fabulous occasion. Usually we have a wonderful dinner and we have um, wine flowing and we have speeches. This time, of course, we have a different situation and myself, together with Alison Lewis, Gary Marstens, Yu Kordo and Ed Rybitsky, we were tasked to try and think about how we could do something differently. So, we were inspired by Priya Parker's book called The Art of Gathering. And you will see that the way we've, we've planned this evening is completely different. So our VC has already explained the significance of being a UCT fellow, and she has praised and paid tribute to the accomplishment of the newly elected fellows. So now you all know that we are in highly accomplished, remarkable company here. And if you really want to know more, there's a feature page on the website and there's also other information on the website where you can read up all about their achievements. So what we thought this evening is not to talk about the, um, the, um, the careers of the new fellows or their accolades, but rather to hear about the more personal sides of our colleagues. So this evening, we have six speakers. We've asked each of them to talk about more personal aspects of their lives, and we gave them three topics from which they could choose to talk about. The first topic was their crucible moment, so for each of them to talk, choose the, one of these topics, the first was the crucible moment. The second was for them to tell us something about themselves that would surprise us. And the third topic was they could choose to tell us about the biggest mistake they made. So I think just from those topics, you realize that it's quite a different format. And I think we will actually see very personal sides of our colleagues, and I think you will all enjoy hearing from them. To kickstart this part of the program, we have Professor Alison Lewis, who was instrumental in getting the fellow leadership group, that is our little task group, to think differently and to consider gathering differently. Alison, over to you. Thanks so much, Anusuya. Um, yes, I've been hoist by my own petard here. So. <laughs> Thanks very much. Nowhere is puffed up phoniness more palpable than at conferences. Nowhere else is the chance to have conversations across identities and professions so often wasted. Nowhere else are so many people with influence brought together only for the conversations to remain on the surface. 
And they lurk there because everyone is presenting the best self they think others expect to meet. So that is from Priya Parker's book about high level meetings called The Art of Gathering. It could also describe this very forum, UCT's College of Fellows, and is partly the reason we decided to try and dig a little deeper and chose these fiendishly difficult speech titles. So I don't have one giant mistake that I can remember, rather lots of little ones that took me off my course. And I don't have a single crucible moment, rather many little mini explosions and bursts of light. And of course, the point of this topic is to share the real underlying stuff and not to humble brag and pseudo boast about great research insights and wonderful academic breakthroughs. I did have big dreams about universities, specifically the University of Cape Town. In the 70s, in my parochial social milieu, the concept of going overseas to study didn't feature. I went to a narrow, insular, all white, all girls school. I did domestic science, in other words, baking cakes and sewing aprons as a subject until grade eight. And our French teacher, Madame, was a subject of scandal because we saw cigarettes in her handbag and she was also divorced. Our science teacher resigned. So Donna Fitzsimons and I signed up for William Smith Saturday sessions in a desperate attempt to pass physical science. And somehow, this all culminated in getting the hallowed telegram from the engineering faculty officer accepted for chemical engineering. I arrived at UCT and I was just blown away, mostly by the idea, but also by the ivy covered buildings, the incredible vista from Devil's Peak, the scent of learning and knowledge and professors and textbooks. And the reality was a mixture of agony and ecstasy. The agony of getting 25% for my first chemistry test, having to stay until 6 p.m. to finish the horrible physics practicals, crying over engineering drawing and trying to think spatially, feeling my brain stretch and strain and buckle under the pressure of transport phenomena, thermodynamics and process control. And then every now and again, an incredible light in the darkness when my first set of punch cards ran without a mistake, when the applicability of triple integrals became clear in engineering maths, and when I could suddenly visualize hyperbolic and parabolic partial differential equations. Thank you, Daya, for that wonderful little course that turned that light on for me. The other thing that blew me away at UCT happened on the 31st of May, 1981, Republic Day. Andrew Bahrain had just been released from 90 day detention and gave an anti Republic Day speech in Jamison Hall. I was absolutely transfixed. He was so young, so brave, but also so clear and directed in condemning apartheid and all of its structures. I was pretty naive. I had volunteered at the Institute of Race Relations and taught night classes there whilst I was still at school. But the white person discomfort that I felt about apartheid had never been so directly challenged and simultaneously given direction. I signed up immediately to join the new SAS group called Projects Com, and I suddenly met a whole group of young, opinionated, powerful, educated activists who called themselves the student left. All those crucible moments and war stories are the subject of another talk, but they include spells in prison, illegal border hopping, and photostatting illegal ANC pamphlets using the ChemEng department's photostatting machine. Both of these crucible threads are tied together by a dream. The first being the idealized and probably naive dream of university. One of my favorite walks at UCT is still along University Avenue, breathing in the smell of academia and remembering how pure it felt to my 17 year old first year heart. And the other dream is the idealized notion of truth and justice and that good can triumph over evil. So I'd like to end off with a story that frames the importance of both of these dreams for me. 
No matter how quotidian or prosaic my daily life in management as a dean might be. Three quarry workers were cutting for stone. They worked all day, cutting at the quarry face and loading the skips. One of them decided that he was destined for better things and he told his mates he was off to find spiritual enlightenment. A year later he was back, putting on his apron and picking up his pick and chisel. What happened to your spiritual journey? asked his brothers. Oh, he said, I saw the dream, the cathedral in Paris that is being built with our stone. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So our next speaker is Linda Gale Becker from the Faculty of Health Sciences. Welcome, Linda. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I'm very privileged and honored to be inducted into this group of fellows and thank you Professor Pekang and and the team for for this opportunity. A crucible moment has been has been described as a moment that happens for us and not to us. I thought I would reflect on two such moments that proved to be the proverbial fork in the road of my career path. I set my sights on being a doctor at the ripe old age of three years old, and I left UCT Medical School having determined to be a geriatrician. I had been influenced by the remarkable textbook by J.P. Mehring and was sure that this was my lifelong vocation. As a young Zimbabwean with many bursaries to repay, I ended up in northern KwaZulu-Natal a busy and happy young bush doctor administering to what I affectionately regarded as my golden oldies. However, the true force of the HIV epidemic was unleashed on South Africa in the late 80s. This truly was the epicenter and the eye of the AIDS storm. Finding myself in the midst of unprecedented death and suffering among the young and fit, I was frustrated and dismayed by my inapparent ability to save the dying, despite seven years of excellent medical school training. At the time, I was planning a two year waterway boat trip to Egypt with a team of explorers led by the famous Kingsley Holgate, a well known uh, KwaZulu explorer. When I got a message from Professor Benneter, Solly Benneter, to come to fill a registrar post at short notice. That took me from geriatrics to infectious diseases, launching a lifelong relationship with HIV and TB, and the deep engagement with communities ravaged by these twin epidemics right here in Cape Town. The second moment was the realization that whilst I had found a vocational passion, something was still missing. A chance encounter with Professor Gilla Kaplan, an ex-South African living in New York City and a fierce TB immunologist. And here I must say an aside, fierce, passionate women are to be revered, emulated, and wherever possible, unleashed. Her offer to supervise my doctoral studies led to an aha moment that the missing ingredient in my career was in fact research. The questions I, I, I had could be answered. I could assuage my seeming insatiable curiosity. So a second fork in the road, leaving conventional medicine, which I loved, and pursuing a life of research. I must also acknowledge the late Professor Stain and Professor Gary Martins who contributed to my doctoral experience. This led to a four year adventure moving between the Rockefeller University in downtown Manhattan and Cape Town. I not only had the mind expanding opportunity of living and working in New York City, having traveled very little in my youth, but also studying at the Rockefeller University, which has produced many Nobel laureates and nurtures great science. These anecdotes illustrate moments where the fork in the road offers the option of a planned, well thought through path or the way of the heart and not of passion. I've been fortunate 
that I have not ever regretted following the path of passion. Over and out, Prof Chinsami. Thank you so much, Gail, uh, Linda Gail. That was absolutely fabulous. It's just wonderful to hear of your journey in your career. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Johan Fagan from the Faculty of Health Sciences. Johan. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to just start by saying that to be acknowledged by one's own institution is truly special for me and my family. We have been key to my professional journey. Um, I would like to emphasize that as a surgeon and a clinical researcher, one can only excel academically with the support of the university, of the Faculty of Health Sciences, of the Provincial Health Department, the hospital management and staff, and one's medical colleagues and, 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 and my surgical trainees, because as surgeons, you know, the operating theater, the ward and the clinics are our, are our laboratories that, that generate research ideas and research opportunities. Uh, but let me move on to, to what I deem, deem probably my biggest mistake that I've made, or might I say almost made. As a UCT student in the early 1980s, I was awarded Western Province Colors for flying hang gliders off of mountain peaks. And um, I then decided to, decided to buy a, a micro light um, conversion kit for my hang glider. Now this is a three wheel wheeler, uh, an aluminium frame that one simply clamps onto the hang glider frame. And um, it has a canvas seat and it has a petrol engine which is mounted behind, you, behind your back with a pusher prop. Now in the 1980s, there were no instruction guides, there were no lessons, no regulations or pilot's licenses uh, and to fly microlights. So it was really free for all situation. So I, so I took my hang glider and the undercarriage to a small town called Bitsant, which is at the mouth of the Beira River. I assembled it next to the main road into the town. I attached my parachute onto the microlight frame and I took off from the public road when there was a gap between cars. At about the height of Signal Hill, uh, above the river mouth, mouth, the glider started shaking violently. And um, as the motor and the propeller were behind me, and I was wearing a full face helmet, uh, I simply could not see what the problem was. And I thought I'd have to throw out my parachute so the glider and I could jointly come down to earth safely. However, after cutting the engine, uh, this violent shaking stopped. So I glided down and flattened the farmer's fence on landing. Now, on inspecting the glider, I discovered that I had forgotten to fasten my seat belt, and this had caught and sheared the, 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 the wooden propeller, so making a large tear in the wing. It then dawned upon me, and this, this still gives me cold shivers when I think about it, is that, that had I thrown out my parachute, which was attached not to me, but to the microlite frame, and because I was not strapped into the glider by the seat belt, I would have fallen out and free fallen down to earth, while the glider, which was suspended to the parachute, would have gently landed some time after me. And I would most certainly not have been here with you tonight, celebrating my election to the College of Fellows today. Thank you very much. Wow, we are very, very pleased that you are with us today. <laughs> what a story. Uh, our next speaker is Mark Fleshman from the Department of um, Drama from the Faculty of Humanities. Mark. Hi. Good evening, everybody. Um, this is indeed a great honor. Um, I would like to share with you this evening two crucible moments and something about me that might surprise you. The first crucible moment occurred when my teacher, Professor Mavis Taylor, literally on her deathbed, leant over to me and whispered, it's up to you now. What I think she was referring to back then was an injunction to stay in the department at UCT and to continue the process she had initiated of what we would today call transformation. The second crucible moment had in fact occurred some years before the first. At the end of my second year of undergraduate study in the early 1980s, when I visited the market theater for the first time, on the weekend in question, the theater was hosting a women's theater festival and every nook and cranny of the building was packed with a multitude of performances, all created by local theater makers. Surveying this range of theater made by South Africans for South Africans about South African issues made me realize what I was doing studying theater at UCT. 
Suddenly I understood what the point of it all was and I made a promise to myself that I would, upon graduation, return to work at the Market Theatre. These two moments were fundamentally in tension. One path led away from Cape Town and involved an immersion in a professional career making theatre in a South African idiom. The second path involved remaining in Cape Town, staying at UCT and pursuing a career in academia as a teacher of an increasingly diverse body of students. Needless to say, as a 21 year old, I was more inclined to follow my own dreams than the injunctions of my teachers. And so I took the first path and ended up working at the Market Theatre under the mentorship of artistic director Barney Simon. Here I learned the intricacies of an ethical theatre making practice rooted in the particularities of this place and characterised by a commitment to social justice. So far, nothing surprising. However, after spending a number of years in Johannesburg, I moved again. No, not back to UCT, but off to join the circus. And this is not some kind of rhetorical flourish, it's a fact. The Dream Circus was a small travelling circus boasting a beautiful new tent, a small cast of first time circus performers, a young man over seven foot tall who claimed to be the tallest man in Africa, a Congolese security guard come circus strongman with a heart of gold and a criminal record for culpable homicide, a couple of ducks, a few dogs and a pony. It was an example of what is known as new circus with less focus on animal acts and more on theatricality. It was the brainchild of two South African clowns who had been apparently working in similar circuses in Europe for some time and who had sold a vision and business plan to a number of large corporates who had injected the cash to make the dream circus a reality. One of these two clowns was a graduate of UCT and was a classmate of my partner and he had convinced her that her immediate future lay in the circus as a trapeze artist. We were all carried away by the dream of the dream circus, the romance of it all, and we didn't spend much time worrying about the details, that the traveling circus life is really very hard, particularly for people not brought up in it, and that you actually need circus performers to make up a circus. I was taken on board as a manager and the possibility of a directorial role was dangled in front of me too. And so we packed up our house in Joburg and exchanged it for a secondhand caravan. It soon became clear that most of the performers contracted to make up the show had very low levels of skill. An actor who displays much skill when performing on stage does not necessarily make for a talented equine acrobat or a skilled juggler. It soon became clear to me that we did not have enough performance to make a show and that even where the performers were fast learners and were mastering some circus skill, this would not be enough to convince an audience to part from their cash. But when I tried to say this to the two clowns, they insisted that between them they had enough acts to make up a show on their own and that I should not worry. Unfortunately, they were not inclined to show these acts to anybody, so I could not verify this information. Finally, as the date for the first performance loomed, the clowns bowed to pressure and arranged a run through of all the acts that would make up the performance. I was hopeful that this was the occasion for me to be able to show off my directorial skills to shape these acts into an audience ready show. What became obvious very quickly as the run unfolded was that despite the best efforts of the new circus performers, the clowns themselves had very little by way of entertaining acts and there was no show to speak of with the grand opening imminent. It was at this point that the real circus people orbiting around the dream circus stepped in and produced a plan that at the very least would ensure that there was a show to open with. This involved bringing back to South Africa a veteran trapeze performer from Las Vegas to anchor the aerial component of the show and despite being detained at the airport for possession of pornography and drinking a bottle of brandy every night, he did provide some solid and real circus skills and the Dream Circus opened on schedule and survived in a manner of speaking for around a year until it got stuck trying to cross the mountains out of Cape Town when all the vehicles broke down. I suppose it was at that, at that moment of the first run through when the emptiness at the centre of the circus project was revealed that I made the decision to leave. My partner was less keen to give up on the dream, having worked very hard to learn the skills of the aerialist. And so I decided to stay around Cape Town while she worked the circus out of her system. This led me ironically back to UCT to complete my MA and to teach for the first time. And when the circus experience finally came to an end, we made a production that merged the aerial skills from the circus with our theater training. And this very successful production toured around the world for the next three years, laying the foundation for for what is now Magnet Theatre, the company I run with Jenny Resnick and Man Lambotwe, and the laboratory for all the research that has brought me to this point. 
And although there was a three year break after my first stint at UCT before I was officially appointed on a permanent contract, the circus experience seems to me to have been a peripatia, a turning point of a sort from one life path to another, because it led me to accept Mavis's injunction to take up the cudgels at UCT Drama, now the Center for Theatre, Dance and Performance Studies, where I have remained for the last 27 years. From one circus to another, one might say. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. What an incredible journey you've had. It's just amazing to hear the story. Um, our next speaker is from the Department of Economics, and it's Harun Borat. And over to you, Harun. Thanks very much, Professor Chinsami. Um, again, just to reiterate the previous speakers, it's a, truly an honor, truly an honor to be recognized uh, in the list. I was going through the UCT College of Fellows and um, I had to double check that my name was really there. So, so really, really honored to be recognized by your peers. I think it is the greatest uh, honor as a researcher um, uh, to, 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 to appear in that list. Um, I, I chose my crucible moment uh, simply because it's a story uh, that I've gone back to in many, many different uh, uh, fora and told the story to many different people, actually. And I thought this may be a, a, a nice, a nice sort of opportunity to share it with, with the group assembled here. And, and perhaps to begin by saying, take yourself back to the 1980s. Um, in South Africa and specifically for me on the Cape Flats, uh, South Africa was burning. It was the mid 1980s. Uh, Louis Lachrancy, if you remember, lots of rude songs were sung about him during the uh, during the struggle. Uh, he was the minister of law and order. It wasn't defense then. It was law and order. Um, P.W. Bwerther uh, ruled with an iron fist and a strong wagging finger. Um, and this was the society um, um, I, I, I was living in. I, I was um, a resident in Athlone, which was a, um, a township, many of you know, um, in, in, um, in the outskirts of Cape Town. And my evenings essentially and times as a scholar and a student was spent basically uh, doing and being involved in um, in struggle related activities. So that could be anything from putting up posters for illegal gatherings, uh, printing of T-shirts for mass uh, for distribution at mass meetings, um, attending mass meetings and marches. But perhaps if you like the arc that led to the crucible moment is that the most exciting and and the the, the activity that I got the most satisfaction from was being involved in illicit reading groups. So we had reading groups organized as students and as scholars when we were at school and uh, into university. And the purpose of the reading group was to get through as many banned pieces of literature as possible. And so some of you may know the literature, but, but it involved reading What is to be Done by Vladimir Lenin, Das Kapital, volumes one, two, three, with heated debates about what would Marx have written if he had gotten to volume four? Pedagogy of the Oppressed, Paulo Freire. And I should say all of these uh, books were were photocopied and distributed. Uh, uh, none of, you know, often tell my children these books were not available to us to read. We photocopied them uh, um, under the covers, so to speak, and, and many times <laughs> using UCT photocopying machines. Um, so these reading groups uh, involve, for example, I write, what I, I write What I Like by Steve Biko. These reading groups became the fulcrum through which you, uh, you uh, the lens you use to understand the struggle and to fight uh, the struggle against institutionalized racism. Uh, many of us have been through this. Um, but then the crucible moment came and it came in the form almost by chance where I stumbled onto an illegal BBC documentary. And it was an illegal BBC documentary because as many of you know, journalists, foreign journalists used to sneak into South Africa and secretly interview usually South African activists. So we'd often be in this almost surreal world where we would, we would have banned uh, television documentaries shown to us um, um, of foreign journalists interviewing South African activists in South Africa. But the interview I was looking at um, 
uh, and the interview I was engaging with was slightly different because it wasn't a South African activist. Instead, it was a researcher and in fact an academic. And he was talking very, very eloquently about South Africa's system of migrant labor. What he spoke about was a very sort of deliberate, almost, almost um, dispassionate explanation of how migrant labor operated in South Africa. The um, interviewee spoke about the poll, poll tax, the hut tax, historically how the mines used and saw uh, black labor as a source of uh, cheap uh, input into the production of, uh, of uh, and, and extraction of gold or whatever metal it may be. And he spoke again about how this was the genesis of a marginalized urban working class. But the crucial difference was that this interviewee explained the story about migrant labor using terminology such as real and nominal wages, the push and pull factors in models of migration. He spoke about, um, uh, he used graphs, tables, figures. I'd never seen this. My understanding of of thinking about a society was always about uh, the big picture, Lenin and Marx and the foreign sort of uh, uh, struggle heroes we had about how to change a society. But here was a person actually talking in a very detailed way um, about how you could understand a social issue using numbers, using data, using empirics. And I didn't know at the time, but this person of course was an economist. Um, and in fact, uh, he is, a, 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 or he was, a UCT economist. But in that moment, in that crucible moment of the BBC interview, my love for economics was born. It was very, very clear to me that I suddenly could use numbers, because I love mathematics and data, to tell an empirically powerful yet socially relevant stories, uh, as well as um, um, uh, provide information about individuals in the South African society. You could answer questions like, how powerful are South African trade unions? What level should one set the minimum wage at? What is the trade-off between wages and employment? All those sort of socially relevant questions, you could actually answer with, with mathematical models, with data, with empirics. Um, and this for me was, <laughs> I keep on going back to this arc of my career and I realized when I had heard that BBC interview on a black and white television, that was the moment I realized I could do something different uh, and something useful with my with with my life, as it were. Um, the final end to the story is then I, having seen the BBC interview, I then go off to UCT uh, amidst amidst student protests and enroll for my first class in microeconomics one. And the first lecture I had was the UCT academic himself, who I'd heard on the BBC program earlier. And I'll leave you with this final thought that this very UCT professor, and I'm not going to tell you his name, I'm going to leave it with you to go and figure it out, is fittingly one of UCT's life fellows currently. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Harun. What a fabulous story. It's amazing how one's journey actually, uh, where one's journey takes one. Our next speaker is uh, Jonathan Blackburn from the Institute for Infectious Diseases and Molecular Medicine, and I see he's around already. Welcome, Jonathan. Please, if you can talk to us. Thanks, Anisia. Um, as the others have said, um, it's a great honour to be elected to this fellowship, and I'm really thankful to UCT for the recognition. So when I was invited to talk today, I wasn't quite sure what a crucible moment was. So I went to look it up and I was relieved to find that I didn't have to talk about uh, plays by Arthur Miller that I'd seen or about World Championship snooker games in my whole hometown of Sheffield. Um, I was more interested to learn that crucibles were used by medieval alchemists in their attempt to transform base metals into gold. And since alchemy gave rise to modern chemistry and since all my degrees are in chemistry from Oxford, a very medieval university, I decided to read a bit more about this. Now, it turns out that some of the oldest known books on alchemy were written by Zosimos of Panopolis around 300 AD, but alchemy must have existed earlier in China, uh, since it's said that the Chinese emperor issued an edict in around about 175 BC, threatening with death any alchemist found guilty of making counterfeit gold. So obviously the emperor knew a thing or two about chemistry, because over the next 
2,200 years or so, turning to lead into gold, into actual gold, has proved to be really quite tricky. So fast forward then to Cambridge in the late 1990s, when I was a newly appointed junior academic in the biochemistry department. And I wasn't working on alchemy, but I was, I think, about to have a crucible moment of sort. So I was cycling up Hills Road one day on my way to the lab, and I was thinking about a specific problem in my research, but I should probably have been concentrating on the traffic. And I had an idea that really solved the immediate problem that I was working on. But by the time I'd got to the lab, I'd realised that my idea had much broader ramifications because I'd essentially figured out then how to clone and express every human protein without having to know the sequence of the individual genes, which was lucky because the human genome sequence hadn't been completed by then, never mind annotated. I'd also worked out um, that there may be an application for the idea that I'd had in the pharmaceutical industry. And so at the tender age of 33, I decided that I should form a biotech company. Now, having not done anything like this before, I thought it would be sensible to seek some advice. So I went to see the emperor, uh, okay, actually the president of the Royal Society, trying to turn basic science into gold was something that should really be left to older academics near the end of their career. Fortunately, he didn't threaten me with anything worse. So as a young and impatient scientist, I decided to ignore that advice and I went ahead and formed my company, Sense Proteomic, anyway. Encouraged by the Tech Transfer Office at Cambridge, uh, having also secured at the time what seemed to be an unimaginably large amount of funding from a venture capital firm in London. Now, at the time, I was only the third person in my department to form a biotech company, and the three of us were clearly looked on with deep suspicion by our, by our other colleagues, as if we were doing something totally unbecoming of academics. Fortunately for me, one of the other two was my head of department, Professor Tom Blundell, who some of you will know. So I had strong internal support in my department for what I was doing. I found it interesting that two years later, a sea, a sea change had happened in my department, thanks in part to a new focus from the funding agencies in the UK on the likely benefits to UK PLC from the outputs of publicly funded research, as well as an increased appreciation from many people of the value that could accrue to the university from spin-outs. And I noticed two years later that all those same colleagues were now suddenly looking at themselves, asking what was wrong with their research that they didn't have a company on the side. So now my true crucible moment though, came in mid 2000, a few years later, when in a, in a very much a headstrong moment, I walked into my head of department's office and told him that I decided to resign from the university to go and run my company. Uh, Tom Blundell sat me down, gave me a cup of tea and said, I wouldn't do that if I were you, Jonathan. Let me fix it for you to take some common leave from the university for two years. We'll talk again. Now, this was really sage advice from a great mentor, and this time I listened. And so two years later, sure enough, I was back in the department, exactly where Tom Blundell knew I'd be, having by then realised that the very significant potential of coupling academia as a breeding ground for new ideas with biotech as an engine to drive wider uptake of inventions and innovations. But at the same time, I'd realised that I craved the intellectual freedom of academia to pursue those new ideas more than I craved gold. So interestingly, the experience I gained in my short time running the biotech company gave new purpose to much of the research that I've done in academia since that time. Gone was the pure blue skies research that I'd carried out as a junior academic, and it was replaced by an understanding that the unmet biomedical needs of patients and clinicians represent a really powerful starting point for true translational research. And you know what they say about necess necessity after all. And so whether in my case it's the discovery and validation of uh, new diagnostic markers of tuberculosis disease that can be measured in a patient urine sample in a low resource field setting, or whether it's delineating the functionality of an autoantibody responses in immune surveillance in cancer patients, or even developing simple tests for neutralizing antibody function in COVID-19 patients, literally today's result. Um, these are the things that I focus on now. So the time in the biotech company also showed me um, the importance of translating my own research beyond publication of interesting results and through to innovations that have the potential to impact healthcare. And this is something that my group is actively engaged in on several fronts today also showed me the critical importance of building long-term interdisciplinary collaborations between fundamental scientists and clinical groups in specific disease areas as a means to ensure relevance of what we were doing. 
That biotech experience also taught me a number of other things. Now, obviously, I learned that cash is king and to buy low, sell high. But perhaps more importantly, it also taught me the value of thinking strategically about how to get where I wanted to go, of listening to what others were saying, not just to the sound of my own voice, and to be more decisive, trusting my entrepreneurial judgment and taking responsibility for my decisions. All things that I hadn't previously been very good at as a junior academic. Now, the biotech company I formed back then still exists and is flourishing, albeit with a different name, and it funds both research and jobs at UCT today. And whilst I can't claim that it's transformed lead into gold, well, not yet anyway, the technology that came out of my academic lab is being used now by nine of the top 10 pharmaceutical firms worldwide to more accurately diagnose early disease, to stratify patients into distinct subgroups with differing underlying etiologies, and to predict patient response to treatments in cancers and in autoimmune diseases. So I'm happy to say, therefore, that the process of transforming my biomedical research into socioeconomic value in the precision medicine field, I think is well underway now. And it's all really thanks to the crucible moment I had back as a junior academic. Thank you very much and back to you, Anisia. Thank you so much, Jonathan. That was really quite fascinating to hear about your crucible moments and especially about all the lessons you've learned. That's really very, very interesting. So I wish to thank all of you for sharing your personal anecdotes with us and showing us parts of your real selves. And I think this has um, certainly allowed us to, to come together quite differently than the previous speeches that we've had in the past. So thank you very much. And I want to say that I look forward to meeting all of you in some days soon. So I'll hand you back to Professor Pakeng. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anisuya. Colleagues, please join me in thanking the people who made this event possible and gave it such a warm atmosphere, even in this online space. I thank Professor um, uh, Sue Harrison at DVC for Research and Internationalization, for acting as Program Director, Professor Anisuya Chinsemi Turan for hosting the informal part of our program, and of course, Professor Alison Lewis for the idea and the committee that worked together with her and Professor Anusuya Chinsemi um, Turan. Thank you so much for the thinking behind what unfolded today. It was really, really inspiring. Thank you to the communications and marketing department for organizing the event and managing the many details. And I thank Young Research Award recipients and the new fellows for giving us so many good reasons to celebrate together. Colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our College of Fellows event for 2020. Thank you so much for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your evening.